Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to another edition of the Almighty Creator versus the Gods of the Slave Trade, Path 5. Our research question remains, are the gods, or whatever the religions of Islam, Christianity and Judaism, reverence, the same as the Almighty Creator of heaven and earth? And was whatever the Negroes referenced, the devil, or actually the Almighty Creator of heaven and earth? Important notice. It is not our intention to offend anyone with this video. Our goal is to determine if whatever these religions reverence is the same as the Almighty Creator of Heaven and Earth. And the Almighty Creator of Heaven and Earth couldn't have sanctioned the slave trade as a mode of conversion of Negroes. The horrors of the slave trade show that the perpetrators are of the devil. Let us start by referencing a book called A Universal History of the Religious Rites, Ceremonies and Customs of the Whole World, or a complete and impartial view of all the religions in the various nations of the universe, and it was written by William Hurd, D.D., and it was published in 1811. Here we see where it tells us that notwithstanding they have no books, no scriptures, nor even any civil laws for their political governments, yet it is certain they are not destitute of all religion. They dedicate and set apart Tuesday for the worship of their fetishes, as we do Sunday to the service of God. So further on the next page, it tells us that this day of rest is very strictly observed. But going further down, it shows us that there is one of their fetishes, it seems, whom they acknowledge superior to all the rest. When anyone asks them what notion they entertain of the deity, they answer that he is black like themselves, and that instead of being their bountiful benefactor, he acts like a tyrant and an oppressor. To this, our historian replied, in the language of a missionary, that God is white like us, is good and gracious, and has done great and marvelous things for us, that he descended from heaven to earth for our sakes, and was crucified by the Jews for our salvation, that after the dissolution of these our earthly tabernacles, our souls shall take their flight to the celestial regions. But all this seemed mercant and jargon to these Negroes, who chiefly opposed the divine providence alleging that they were no ways indebted to the deity, but to the earth, the waters, the planets, etc., for the many blessings they enjoyed, and it is no wonder at all to hear them talk in this strain. If we will but give ourselves the least time to reflect, we may easily discern the weakness and insufficiency of such arguments with the Negroes especially on the absurdity of insisting on the whiteness of the God of the Christians, in opposition to the black deity, could no better way be found out to confute the Negroes than by recommending a God to them of another color from their own. Now, our point of interest here is where it says the God of the Christians. And then, could there be no better way to confute the Negroes? These are two things we have to note very well. Our question becomes, is the deity they are referring to different from the God of the Christians? Yes. But then, is the God of the Christians the creator of heaven and earth? This is subject to your interpretation. But from what they are writing, it is obvious that they knew that the gods of the Christians was not the creator of heaven and earth. Remember, in one of the series, in the 1714 book, they did write that the Negroes own a God that created heaven and earth. So again, what they are bringing now couldn't have been the same as what the Negroes were worshipping. So this is where we are anchoring on to establish whether or not the gods of Christianity, Islam and Judaism are the same as the almighty creator of heaven and earth. So from the same book, we see where it tells us that the natives of Biafra offer up all they have 
even their most darling infants, to the devil. And they are extremely addicted to the study and practice of the black art and all magical incantations, flattering themselves that they by those mysterious operations they can influence the elements and all the products of nature. So the interesting part here is where it tells us there that when we talk here of the devil, we do not mean that evil spirit which our Christian divines treat of, but a thing, a being, a spirit only which we are at a loss to define or give any adequate idea of, but in all probability it may be the sole object of some people's worship and frequently it is no more than a chimera of their priest's invention or a strong impulse or a delusion of their own disordered imagination. So again, we see that the Negroes had a god that was a spirit being that they were at a loss what to call, so they chose to call it the devil. So we will now try to see if it was indeed the devil or actually the creator of heaven and earth. So but if we read further down in the same highlighted box, we see where it tells us that we shall here amuse our readers with one particular custom which is as idle as it is extravagant and in all probability extremely painful. The natives of Rio Rio and the parts adjacent as also the Negroes of Edra declined the ceremony of circumcision with respect to their females as well as several others amongst the Africans but have substituted another in the room of it which is much more incommodious and uneasy. At least from here we see that the Africans or the Negroes were rejecting female circumcision. So that means somebody must be introducing it to them. We'll leave that apart for now and continue with what we're talking about. So in the light of the allegation that the Negroes sacrificed their children to the devil, let us reference a book called Satan, His Origin, Work and Destiny, written by Charlie O. B. Haynes and it was published in 1905. So we see the following. So it says, so it can be plainly discerned that the entire devilism of the dark ages with all its trumpery of horns, hoofs, pitchforks, gridirons and imps that act as stokers of the furnaces of hell is merely a device of the arch deceiver himself designed to deceive and delude people into a denial of his own existence in order that men may thus be thrown off their guard and the more easily ensnared and deceived. This medieval devilism is utterly unknown to the Bible and Christianity. So we note that it is utterly unknown to the Bible and Christianity. So the question becomes, who was behind the allegation that the Negroes were sacrificing their children to the devil? Now that we have seen what the devil means, in their own words, that it does not mean the same devil as the one talked about by Christians. And again, we have seen that even the concept of devil is alien to Christianity based on this book we referenced. Let us also quickly reference the Journal of Negro History by Katagi Woodson and it was published in 1917, Volume 2. And it tells us that, so here we see about a Muslim or Mohammedan slave raid and it tells us that the chief not having a sufficient supply of slaves on hand to trade caused his big drums to be beaten and organized two bands of troops to execute a raid among the hidden tribes to the east and southwest. The raiding bands attacked only tribes with whom they were at war or who refused to adopt the Mohammedan religion. So again, we see that those that refuse to adopt the Mohammedan religion are the ones that are being attacked. By simple common sense, it means before they can be attacked, they must have been told that they must convert to the Mohammedan religion or be attacked, at least before they can be uh, known or identified as refusing to adopt the Mohammedan religion, they must have been told about the religion. 
again remember they are saying they are hidden tribes that means at least they were not practicing christianity or islam and we had seen that whatever they were practicing they had a god a spirit being that they were reverencing and worshiping so the question becomes which god is the creator of heaven and earth is it the christian god or the mohammedan god or the judaism god or the god of the negroes so that becomes a big question which the facts they recorded themselves should help us to prove so again if we reference fighting the slave hunters in central africa a record of 26 years of travel and adventure around the great lakes and of the overthrow of tip tip tibo Rimeliza, and other great slave traders by alfred j swan with an introduction by Etcher Johnston and published 1910, we see the following account. Here he tells us that Mohammedanism had done little for them except to make them consider the Creator their special protector and the vast multitudes of natives their legitimate prey, ranking them about on an equality with the animals in the forest. Again, remember when we mentioned about Danfodio who is the, um, a prophet to the Fulanese who alleged or claimed that God had given them the riches and um, land of the so-called unbelievers or Kafirs as they call them. And remember we asked why this their God does not give them the land of the Europeans, the Japanese or the Chinese. It only gives them the land of those that they can beat or they can kill. And of course the Christians capitalized on that to give them weapons and that's why you see all the wars in Africa today. Remember, when you see wars in Africa, it's rarely one nation against the other. It's usually one group, usually the same group that was used to capture and sell the Negroes as slaves. And of course, the Arabs. So they get the weapons and they are killing people on the premise that their God had given them the land and riches of those people. So your question becomes, the God that gave them those lands, is it the same as the creator of heaven and earth that created the people they are killing? We don't think so. And here again, you see that they were seeing all the other people as legitimate prey, ranking them about on an equality with the animals in the forest. And that was exactly how the slave trade was done. It was purely religious, based on the gods of these Christians, Muslims, and so-called Jews. So let us move forward to see exactly what we are talking about. Also, if we reference another book called The Fullers of Central Africa and the African Slave Trade by W.B. Hutchison and it was published in 1843, we see the following. Here he tells us about the Fulanese that they are the missionaries of Islam among the pagan Negro tribes. Where they have conquered, they have forced the adoption of the Quran by the sword. And whilst pursuing quietly their pastoral occupations, they become schoolmasters, malims, and thus propagate the doctrines and precepts of Islam. Wherever the fuller has wandered, the pagan idolatry of the Negro has been overthrown. The barbarous fetish and grigri have been abandoned, anthropophagy and cannibalism have been suppressed, and the horrible sacrifice of human beings to propitiate the monstrous gods of the Negro barbarian has been supplanted by the worship of the true God. The Reverend M. Scorn, who accompanied the British expedition to the Niger or Quora in 1841, says that the people of Ida, a Negro town on that river south of the country inhabited by the Fulas, are pagans. No mixture of Mohammedanism is observable. In their customs, they, show me, they showed me their gods. Under a small shed, erected before almost every house, were broken pots, pieces of yams, feathers of fowls, horns of animals, broken bows and arrows, knives and spears. Such were their gods. They denied ever having sacrificed human beings, which I could hardly credit. So again, remember, there is no way they could have sacrificed humans that you won't see the remains there. If they were sacrificing animals and you see the remains, there is no way they could have sacrificed humans that you wouldn't see the remains there. Let us again reference a book called Savage Africa being the narrative of a Thor in equatorial, southwestern and northwestern Africa with notes of the habits of the gorilla on the existence of unicorns and tailed men on the slave trade. 
written by W. Winwood Reed, and it was published in 1864. It is important that you note that there are so-called third men in this book. But let us move forward. So here it gives us an interesting narrative of the Ken and Abel story. And according to the book that we just referenced, it's saying that it is one of the chief peculiarities of the Sierra Leone Negro that he hates with an intense and bitter hatred this white man to whom he owes everything. This Christian feeling is propagated even by the native preachers for one is said to have explained our origin from the pulpit in the following manner. My brethren, you see white man bad too much, ugly too much, no good. You won't savvy how man like that come to live in the world. Well, I tell you, Adam and Eve, they colored people, very handsome, live in one beautiful garden. They are they had all things that be good. Plantains, yam, sweet potatoes, fufu, pan wine, high too much. Then they have two children, Ken and Abel. Ken no like Abel palaver. One day he kill him. Then God angry and he say, Ken, Ken go hide himself. He think him clever. Hey, hey, God say again. Ken, you think I no see you? You bush nigga, eh? Then Ken come out and he say, yes, master, I live here. What the mother's master? Then God saw in one big voice, like the thunder in the sky, wearing brother Abel. Then Ken turned white all over the, with fear. that the first white man, brethren. This is very profane, but profanity is only dangerous in the pulpit and when it is spoken in earnest. This absurd anecdote will make you laugh, and that is all, but you must remember that the effect upon the man's congregation would be very different and would certainly not tend to promote an amiable feeling towards the white population. So you see their narrative at that time of the white man, remember, the slave trade was just the white people and the Arabs and Fulanese were all seen as white. The Babas, the Tuaregs, you notice they were all seen as whites. Let us also reference a book called Africa and the American Negro, Addresses and Proceedings of the Congress on Africa, held under the auspices of the Stewart Missionary Foundation for Africa of Gammon Theological Seminary, in connection with the Cotton States and International Exposition, December 13 to 15, 1895. So there we see the following. Here we see from where it says Religious Beliefs of the Yoruba People in West Africa by Orisatuke Faduma. And it, um, it tells us that Christianity is an evolution of Judaism, yet so evolved that it becomes a new religion. Mohammedanism is a corruption of Judaism, a mingling of monotheism with Arab heathenism. Max Muller, Rawlinson, Sassi, and others have contributed not a little to the study of heathen beliefs. The observations of anthropologists and ethnologists are helping us to get at facts and draw conclusions which otherwise would be impossible. For the present, we shall be satisfied with the presentation of facts as they are not large enough to warrant us in making large deductions. So from the same book, we see a very interesting narrative and it tells us that the Igbo is a proud, daring race. They are always industrious, are fond of display, and in their hospitality are ostentatious. It may be asserted that there exists no evidence to show these people ever to have been pagan in their home on the Niger or elsewhere. As a race, they have never received either Christianity or Mohammedanism, but claim to believe sincerely in God. It goes further to say, those in the British colony have assimilated Christianity and some have attained to the highest culture and refinement. The first Negro graduate of Oxford was an Igbo. The most distinguished physician, Negro physician, Living up to 1881 was Dr. Horton and Igbo. 
The knowledge of reading and writing and ciphering in short rudimentary training in this colony has been very thorough. To Wilberforce and Venn be lasting honor and praise for their effective work in the British colonies of West Africa. So we see again that these people had their religions, they were never pagans, and they didn't have Christianity and Islam. So now that they have joined Christianity and Islam, are they still worshipping the same gods or different gods altogether? So if we reference the map of Africa of 1710 from the University of um, Princeton, we see what it tells us around Guinea that I am credibly informed that the country about 100 leagues north of the coast of Guinea is inhabited by white men or at least a different kind of people from the blacks who wear clothes and have the use of leathers, make silk and that some of them keep the Christian Sabbath. So now we see from what he told us about the Ibos, this is around the area where they also live. So it becomes very clear that when they say African religion, they were tarring everybody with the same brush, which is wrong because not all Africa worshipped the same gods. And likewise, the gods of Christianity, Islam and Judaism in Israel are not likely the same as the creator of heaven and earth. So again, if we looked at travels in Africa from modern writers with remarks and observations written by Reverend William Bingley, we see that about the inhabitants of Biafra, it tells us that its inhabitants are Negroes and idolaters and are said to be much addicted to magic. Some accounts that have been given of them state that they sacrifice their children to the devil or perhaps rather to certain imaginary deities which they worship. This country is watered by a wide but shallow river, the source of which is unknown. The capital is of the same name and is a considerable town distant about 20 leagues from the coast. So again, we see exactly what these people are saying. They are telling us that the Negroes that live in Biafra sacrifice their children to the devil. And now we have been able to see how Christianity and Islam came about. And the obvious fact is, it is likely that the gods of the Negroes or the god of the Negroes was actually the almighty creator of heaven and earth. So here we reference a statement by a rep in the United States thanking God for slavery and she said, I thank God for slavery. If it wasn't for slavery, I might be somewhere in Africa worshipping a tree. Florida State Rep Kimberly Daniels. So this should show you how ignorant most of them still are. And this is a natural Negro attribute because most of them do not even know where they came from, who they were, or the God they worshipped prior to Christian and Muslim invasion of what was Negro land and Guinea. So you see the essence of these narratives now and this video is for you to go and look for the materials, journals, books that we referenced and try to read them yourself. So let us reference Savage Africa again to see what this lady is saying written in a book so you understand how they educate them and brainwash them. And remember this is the power of propaganda. So you see what it tells us here that the typical Negroes dwell in petty tribes where all are equal except the women who are slaves, where property is common and where consequently there is no property at all, where one may recognize the utopia of philosophers and observe the saddest and basest spectacles which humanity can afford. It goes further to say, the typical Negro, unrestrained by moral laws, spends his days in slot his nights in debauchery, he smokes hashes till he stupefies his senses or falls into convulsions, he drinks pan wine till he brings on a loathsome disease, he abuses children, stabs the poor brute of a woman whose hands keep him from starvation and makes a trade of his own offspring, he swallows up his youth in premature vice, he lingers through a manhood of disease and his study death is hastened by those who no longer care to find him food. So again, you notice that 
they made up all these lies to justify the atrocities of the slave trade. We have been able to show you that it was never the Negroes selling themselves. Now, if you read this account, you will see clearly that it is impossible because if the man is always drinking and not doing anything, he's not going to get food. The farms in Negro land and Guinea were all cultivated before the Europeans came and the Arabs and the Fulanese and other non-Negroes. So it is preposterous for anyone to be saying that they just drink and drink and drink and drink. In fact, to even get the palm wine, you have to climb. You have to tap it. There are palm wine tappers. So it's not something you just get and pick by the side of the road. No. So you see that their own lies are based on pure ignorance and mischief making. And you see how this lady has bought that line hook, line and sinker because the best way to hide something from a black man is to actually to write it down in a book. You can see what the lady is saying. It's exactly what the uh, slave trade is supposedly being presented as to the Negroes and the gullible folks who cannot read. So let us move one step further before we round up. Have you ever heard about the word takia in Islam? It's the equivalent of propaganda in Christianity, so to say. And let us look at one little account. And it says, You must know, gentle reader, that I am a Maronite of Mount Lebanon. And at the age of 14, I was sent to the College of Propaganda in Rome to be educated in virtue and doctrine for the ecclesiastical state. And as I then knew no other language but Arabic and Syriac, I began my course of European studies with the ABC, then followed Latin grammar, rhetoric, logic, metaphysics, and one year of divinity. So the essence of bringing you to this is for you to understand how the dummy of how um, slave trade could have been to the advantage of the Negroes was sold in the first place. And you notice that the two religions, Christianity and Islam, of course, including Judaism, have the propaganda technique hidden and embedded in them. So let us reference another book in order to buttress our point and make it very clear. If we reference a book called The Children of Africa written by James B. Bird and it was published in 1910, we see the following account. In Africa, there is a great war going on. Three mighty forces or powers are fighting against one another and victory cannot go to them all. These great forces are Mohammedanism, Hedonism, and Christianity. But to those of us who know the African, it is plain that the great fight will be between the first and the last, that the Africans will be ruled by the cross or the crescent, that the Bible or the Quran will be their holy book, that Mohammed or Christ will be their guide in this life. So again, we see that they did not bring these religions because of salvation or anything or civilization it is for conquest so we have seen how it was happening we have seen how people now tried to make the slave trade look like something good to africa and we have seen that it was a great war so now that you see the propaganda that islam has its own propaganda and christianity has its own but unfortunately the negroes did not have that and that is why you see that these two religions were able to sell their ideology and their deities over and above whoever the Negroes were worshipping. Remember, the Japanese, the Chinese, the North Koreans are not Christians or Muslims or Jews. Those places are peaceful. It's only in Negro areas that they invaded with their ideologies. Let us look at one more material first before we conclude. So if we reference a book called New Voyages and Travels consisting of originals, translations and abridgments written by Sir Richard Phillips, we see why, where it tells us that whilst I was listening to their conversation, one of these Negroes addressing himself to me begged me to write for him the name of Jesus Christ as by promising his sacred name we procured, he said, riches of all kinds. When I had done so, he inquired what he must do to obtain good things from Esa. 
I replied that he must work hard and sleep little. This method did not appear to fulfill his expectations. For placing more faith in amulets than in my advice, he asked me for another grease grease, and I wrote him a prayer on a small slip of paper. The Negroes would worship a straw if they thought it had the power of enriching them. So you see why the Negroes are still Christians or Muslims today, despite knowing fully well that those were weapons of the slave trade. Let us in conclusion reference another material that tells you why the Negroes have remained Muslims or Christians. So if we reference a book called Ismailia, a narrative of the expedition to Central Africa for the suppression of the slave trade organized by Ismail Khadiv of Egypt by Samuel W. Baker, Pasha, and it was published in 1875, we see the following. So here we see that having a thorough knowledge of the African character and knowing that if a Negro gets an idea into his head, that idea can only be eradicated by cutting the head off. I was not fool enough to persist in swimming against a torrent. So this tells you exactly that they know that the Negroes would worship a straw if you convinced them that it was going to enrich them, it was going to make them um, better, or it's going to give them wealth or something. And then you, they also know that if they get the idea into the heads of a Negro, the only way to eradicate that idea would be to cut the head off. So you see why the religions despite being identified as being culprits of the slave trade have remained mainstay in negro life till today we hope we have given you a thought-provoking topic you can research on we hope also you have seen that whatever they have presented as the gods of islam christianity or judaism may not actually be the creator of heaven and earth but a complete deception used to deceive the children of the Most High from worshipping the Almighty Creator of heaven and earth. We thank you very much for listening and we challenge you to look for the materials referenced and study them yourself. And again, we challenge you to remember to conduct your own research. Thank you once again for listening. Shalom.